Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am very pleased to welcome you to this final fourth talk in J.B. Anderson's series on part two of the life and presidency of Barack Obama. J.B. Anderson, your speaker today, really needs no introduction. He's very popular, and I'm sure all of you have been his faithful listeners for, for many, many years. His ongoing series of programs on the US presidents are some of the most popular programs that, that we've offered in the area of history. JB's appearance today is made possible through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with financial support from the Friends of the Ramsey County Libraries. We are very grateful to both these organizations. And now I'd like to turn things over to JB for this last talk in uh, part two of uh, the life and presidency of Barack Obama. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the eighth and final uh, episode. And uh, last week there was a question on Edward Snowden, and uh, I looked him up. Uh, give me a second here. I need, to, I guess my cursor isn't showing. So, uh, uh, he was granted permanent residency in Russia in uh, 2020. He'd been there for uh, several years. Uh, this is uh, Lindsay Mills, who was his uh, romantic partner in the U.S. When he went to Russia, he asked if she couldn't join him, and she did. And they were married in 2017. And they now have a child who's uh, in this photo. His face has been um, concealed. So he is still in Russia. Uh, there was another question, and that dealt with Obama's accomplishments, and I really skirted around it because uh, I did this uh, slideshow a couple of years ago, uh, put it together. It's the first time I've done it uh, to an audience, but um, I have about seven slides at the end of this lecture that deal with uh, Obama's accomplishments. Uh, first uh, thing we're going to talk about is Russia. Uh, what we were dealing with at the end of uh, the session two weeks ago was world affairs. So let's take a look at uh, Russia. Uh, now, I'm going to give you a little history. We're going to talk about after the fall of the Soviet Union about 30 years ago. Uh, but before, before that, uh, NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of which the United States is a member, was started in 1949. And it was started basically as uh, uh, countries that are going to protect each other. And uh, the underlying reason was uh, due to Russia. In response, but seven years, uh, six years later, the Warsaw Pact was started by Russia, and that involved a lot of Eastern European countries and Russia itself. And again, a mutual defense pact. Uh, a lot of people point to this and say, you know, NATO, NATO started this kind of buildup, and then Russia responded to it after a while. After the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Russian areas started considering NATO membership, and it included the Ukraine, here with the arrow in the orange, and in the green, Georgia. Uh, Georgia, by the way, is uh, where uh, Nikita Khrushchev was born and raised. Uh, I, uh, uh, there was a friend uh, who had a party at her house and her grandfather was there and he was, uh, had emigrated to the United States from Russia when he was in uh, sixth grade, his family moved here. Uh, through the sixth grade, he went to school with Khrushchev. 
Uh, here's another uh, larger map shows uh, Georgia uh, on the lower right and the Ukraine near, near the center with the arrow. Uh, and uh, these, these were countries that after the fall of the Soviet Union were thinking about NATO membership. Uh, NATO expanded uh, into formerly uh, Russian held countries in Eastern Europe. I mean, look at this expansion. These are countries that joined NATO after the Soviet Union fell and just simply became Russia again. The Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Slovakia. So a tremendous growth in membership in NATO from former uh, Soviet controlled countries, mostly in Eastern Europe. Uh, Obama uh, talked about this in 2014 and he said, uh, Russia's really no longer a world power. Uh, they have lost all these uh, countries that they had been controlling. What Russia has become is a regional power. Now, the, the uh, response a lot of people make to this is, yes, but they have nuclear weapons. Uh, now, today, uh, with the Ukrainian difficulty, the current crisis there, a lot of people say uh, this isn't related to NATO. I find that kind of surprising. I, I certainly think that it is related to NATO. Uh, little side note here, spring quarter, I'll be doing three psychologists. I uh, taught psychology for many years and then moved into history. Uh, I'll do Stanley Milgram. Most people go, who the heck is that? Uh, he's a guy that did uh, six degrees of separation research. Also research that's been come to be called, would you kill your neighbor? And uh, I'm going to do Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler. So I would love to see everyone spring quarter for these psychology uh, lectures. And I'll get back to the presidents in the fall. Uh, we're going to, next thing we're going to talk about here under world affairs is Cuba. And uh, Nelson Mandela had died. He was the head of South Africa. He'd spent, uh, I think it was 27 years in prison for fighting against apartheid. And well, attending that funeral in South Africa, Barack Obama met up with and shook hands with Ra Raul Castro, who had taken over for his brother Fidel, who was incapacitated at the time. And here's a picture of them uh, shaking hands at the uh, Mandela funeral. Well, Republicans went ballistic. He shook hands with the dictator of Cuba. Uh, here's Richard Nixon shaking hands with Fidel Castro on the left. On the right is uh, George W. Bush hugging Fidel Castro. So the issue becomes where were Republican voices then? Obama was heavily criticized uh, throughout his presidency. Much of what he wanted done was not even considered by uh, the Senate in particular, which was controlled by Republicans. Uh, diplomatic relations with Cuba were restored uh, during the Obama administration. Obama called uh, Pope Francis, pictured here. Uh, Cuba is uh, a, a gigantically Catholic nation. Uh, and uh, Obama thought, uh, boy, if we want to try to make things right with Cuba again, maybe we could use the Pope as an intermediary. And that's exactly what happened is the Pope started to negotiate with Cuba about reopening relationships with the United States. Uh, diplomatic relations had been cut off uh, 50 years earlier and that was under John F. Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy decided that uh, 
we just, uh, this is a communist government in Cuba. We don't want to uh, uh, be in relationships with them. So we're gonna cut off uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, the night before he cut off diplomatic relations and made that speech um, public, the night before he had several people go out to cigar stores and buy up boxes of Cuban cigars, which he loved to smoke, here he is smoking on. So he had uh, supply for a few years uh, locked up. Uh, now that uh, the very next day, uh, we wouldn't be allowed to sell Cuban cigars in the United States anymore. Uh, this is the US Embassy in Havana. Uh, Pope Francis uh, connection had worked very well. Uh, his negotiations with Cuba for the United States led to what's come to be called the Cuban Thaw and uh, relations uh, opened up again with Cuba. Uh, next is Osama bin Laden killing. Osama bin Laden is the person who uh, was held responsible for the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and a plane crashing in a Pennsylvania uh, farm field. Uh, Osama bin Laden was very wealthy, worth several hundred million dollars, and uh, founded and headed Al Qaeda, which uh, he wanted to see uh, restore uh, some rights to Muslim countries. And again, blamed for the 9 11 attacks. Uh, in 2008, seven years after these attacks, uh, W. Bush had been in a, a just, uh, we can't find him. We don't know where he's at. We've been looking. Uh, other people were saying, we don't think you've done anything. Uh, one congressman said, uh, it's, it's really a matter of Osama been forgotten. We're not uh, worried about uh, uh, catching up with this guy who was responsible for the 9-11 attacks at least not under the Bush administration. Uh, searching was done by the Bush administration uh, in Afghanistan, and it was in the Tora Bora uh, Mountains. And I've got an arrow there pointing to uh, the Tora Bora era, area of um, Afghanistan. Uh, most people at the time were saying, you're looking in the wrong spot. He's uh, being uh, uh, held in a safe house in uh, Pakistan. The uh, Pakistani government is uh, protecting him. Uh, many, so again, no real search done by the Bushes, according to critics. Uh, and one of the one of the things that uh, critics were saying is. The Bush family was in the oil business and they were doing business with the bin Laden family, not just Osama bin Laden alone, but his relatives. Uh, they controlled a tremendous amount of oil in that area of the Middle East. So the Bush family isn't interested in uh, destroying their business relationships with the bin Laden family. Uh, as a matter of fact, on 9-11, uh, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush's father and former president, was meeting with members of the bin Laden family, and they were negotiating about oil leases, et cetera. And all planes in the U.S. were grounded uh, after the World Trade Centers were hit with a couple of airplanes. U.S. planes were landing all around the world, especially in Canada. Uh, and uh, the bin Laden family was placed on a plane. Now, no planes were to be in the air. They were placed on a plane and sent back to the Middle East. <clears throat> uh, where is uh, Osama bin Laden? 
Well, it's about a year and a half into the um, Obama administration. It was determined that he was in Pakistan at um, Abbottabad, uh, and there's an arrow pointing to that city uh, on this map. And you can see Pakistan has a common border with India and on the right and a common border with uh, Afghanistan on the left. <coughs> Excuse me. So he's found. Question now is um, how do we kill this guy? And there were two options. One was let's fly over and bomb this uh, house that he's in or this compound or you know, it was a large, large area surrounded by a wall and a, and a very large house. Or should we send raiders in, a ground force, and uh, raid the house? Uh, the decision was that we would uh, raid the house. Uh, that way we could be certain that uh, Bin Laden had indeed been killed, that he was at home, <clears throat> and uh, uh, a bomb would be far less certain. Raid took place on May 1st of 2011. Uh, Obama was, uh, was indeed killed, uh, but that wasn't all that occurred. Uh, papers that were found in the house were uh, gotten out by U.S. soldiers, as were computer drives and uh, Obama's body also, or I, I'm sorry, uh, Bin Laden's body. Uh, the body was DNA tested, and uh, it was found uh, to indeed be Osama Bin Laden. A few hours after the raid, its body was taken out in a U.S. naval ship and uh, buried at sea. You know, some of the, one of the criticisms of this, uh, here's a closer up view of it. One of the criticisms of this was in a few hours, they got a DNA test on the guy, which of course had to happen, but how come when it's a rape kit, it takes weeks to test it, if not months, if not untested completely. <coughs> Uh, both uh, uh, Bush and Cheney had got, did a press conference together, and they announced that it was their efforts during their administration that finally led to this uh, capture and killing of bin Laden. Uh, a lot of people went, what? You guys have been out of office for a year and a half when this occurred, and uh, uh, you'd been... Uh, uh, it's been uh, nine years and nine months since the 9-11 attack. Uh, how could you not have found this guy? <clears throat> uh, some general purpose issues is what we're gonna discuss next uh, in the life of uh, Obama. Uh, first is uh, his status as an African-American. His father was from Kenya, which is a country uh, located in East Africa. Slaves were captured from West Africa. That's much closer to the Americas. You don't have to go all the way around uh, uh, South Africa and uh, uh, to collect slaves. You collect them at the shortest distance possible. That's West Africa. Consequently, Obama is not descended from the slave experience. On your left is uh, territories where slaves were, or Africans were captured, uh, picked up uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, sailed across the Atlantic to the um, <clears throat> Americas. And uh, it's people from those countries there <laughs> in West Africa that um, formed slaves in the Americas. 
Uh, you can see on the right side of the map, the country of Kenya, where Obama's father was from. And uh, there were no slaves taken out of that area and brought to the Americas. It was too long a voyage. We've got to keep it cheap. Um, some of the criticisms of Obama, especially from African Americans, is he's not black enough. His mother was a white woman born in Kansas, living in Hawaii. Um, and she married this uh, black man from Kenya who had come here to study. They met in college. Uh, and uh, another thing that many African Americans did not like was the broad acceptance that uh, Obama had within the white community. Uh, you know, uh, whose, whose interests does he have in mind? Uh, are, are, as African Americans, are we in his best interest? Uh, oh, fall quarter, I'll do George Washington. Um, and that's going to be a giant, a uh, lot of myths that will be busted about uh, Washington. So keep that in mind also. I'm not doing any uh, summer classes. Uh, general personal issues continued uh, is Obama's youth. In other words, you know, how old is he? Uh, one of the criticisms was he's way too young to be president. <coughs> He's 46 uh, years old and he's healthy. And he was running against John McCain who was 72 years old. And from this picture here, you can see some, uh, some difficulties on uh, McCain's face. He had skin cancer. During the campaign, he even had some uh, surgery for this skin cancer. So it was experience versus inexperience were arguments that was used. And it was youth versus age, uh, you know, which is going to serve us best in the White House. Uh, campaign issues, uh, time for a new generation. Uh, the big argument was um, people that had been in World War II had uh, been in the presidency for 60 years, twice as long as any other generation. Usually a generation will get, you know, 25 to 35 years or so in the presidency, controlling state legislatures, controlling governorships, then the next generation takes over. <clears throat> what happened with the World War II generation is, uh, they basically uh, took their children out of office. Uh, they blocked their children's generation from the United States presidency, from the governor's seats around the country, and from control of the state legislatures. The two gentlemen who wrote the book called Generations uh, came to call that generation, of which I am a member, the silent generation, because they are the first generation not to elect a cohort to the presidency or control politics. Uh, and uh, uh, criticism of these World War II guys was uh, uh, they, they spent this 60 year period uh, seeing to it that uh, they had a free college education. They even got monthly payments if they were in college, as well as tuition and books paid for. Uh, Health care until their uh, death uh, and uh, guaranteed home loans, the federal government guaranteed so that they could buy homes. Now this varies. Uh, there were some incidences where people didn't get these things or et cetera, but basically uh, they gave themselves veterans service to death, uh, lots of benefits uh, that were denied to the population generally. <clears throat> Oratorial skills of Obama. Uh, he made uh, 
a lot of speeches. <clears throat> the guy looks good, <clears throat> young and healthy. Uh, so he, uh, and uh, was a great speaker. So he would, uh, he got lots of attention as a result of that, including uh, televised weekly addresses. Uh, it was uh, Franklin Roosevelt that really began communicating with the American public using technology, not just newspapers, but he did it on the radio and he had fireside addresses and, uh, and Obama did that, but using television. Uh, Obama was considered quite exceptional uh, in the speaking abilities. Uh, the number of awards he won for speaking is, uh, we're gonna take a look at them, but it's amazing. He won uh, two Grammy awards, a double Grammy. Uh, they were for spoken word albums. And uh, he had written several books, but two of the books he spoke. So people, especially blind people, could buy a recording of his books done by him. And uh, there are awards for this, these spoken word uh, books uh, given by the Grammys. And again, Obama won two of those. Uh, won a double Grammy, sounds like double whammy but uh, this was a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> he lost uh, the primary when he was running for the Democratic nomination in New Hampshire, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, he made a concession speech and uh, people said, uh, when you make this concession speech about losing, let's make it sound good. So they played music in the background while he was speaking. Uh, this uh, speech is on YouTube. It's had 10 million views. Uh, for that speech, he received an Emmy because it was videotaped. So it counts as uh, TV uh, stuff and it was broadcast on TV. So. So the guy's got two Grammys, now he's got an Emmy. Uh, if you'd like to watch this uh, speech of his, which was considered uh, one of his best, um, it's difficult to be able to write down a website address such as uh, at the top in blue. But if you just simply uh, go into uh, say Safari or whoever your, uh, the carrier is just type in Obama New Hampshire concession speech and it's uh, 13 minutes and 10 seconds in length um, so feel free uh, uh, YouTube loves to have lots of people listening to their stuff and you can listen to this New Hampshire concession speech uh, awards uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 2009. Uh, the reason the Nobel Committee uh, gave for awarding him uh, this Peace Prize the first year that he was in the presidency uh, was for strengthening international cooperation. And uh, what a lot of people say is he really won because there was a general relief that George W. Bush was out of office. Um, and uh, it just seems uh, very suspicious to a lot of people that a guy could win after being president for just a few months. And, uh, no major events to point to <clears throat> that would uh, make this uh, award look legitimate. Uh, talked about that. Uh, uh, Donald Trump was uh, 
taken aback by this too. When he became president, he felt that he deserved a Nobel Peace Prize and on more than one occasion spoke about uh, when's it gonna happen. Also Time Magazine, Person of the Year 2012, they do a Person of the Year uh, every year and they've done it for many decades. Uh, in the 1930s, one of their, their person of the year was Adolf Hitler, uh, interestingly enough, because, uh, you know, we didn't know about concentration camps yet. It was, there weren't a lot of wars going on yet. It was the 1930s, and Germany had come out of the great worldwide depression. Uh, and that was why Hitler got the recognition. Uh, Trump uh, also uh, uh, wanted to be considered for person of the year and an editorial comment said he should be named turd of the year. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Trump never won times uh, person of the year either. Uh, Obama, the smoker. Uh, he smoked cigarettes, uh, did it privately only, uh, so people couldn't see it. Here's a rare photo of him with a cigarette in his mouth. Uh, it was other politicians that said, hey, we can smell it on him. We think he's smoking. Finally, they had to say, yes, he does indeed smoke cigarettes. Uh, again, <clears throat> Franklin Roosevelt frequently pictured with uh, a cigarette. Uh, in photographs uh, that were taken of him. Uh, and the same with uh, Kennedy. But uh, things had changed, attitudes about smoking. Smoking had decreased from about 40% of the society down to about just 20% of people were smoking. So smoking had gotten a, a, a very bad reputation, rightfully so. It's a killer habit. And it and uh, nicotine is a uh, addictive chemical. Uh, Michelle Obama, by in contrast to uh, Barack Obama smoking cigarettes, was uh, as first lady and like other first ladies had a, a project. You know, here's what I'd like to see happening. And her project was healthy living and vegetable gardening. So smoking it was a really major no-no. So they were, <coughs> what they were trying to do uh, public. Michelle Obama would uh, start um, uh, vegetable gardens in schools show students how to do it. Uh, here she is with a raised bed garden in an elementary school and uh, teaching young people about uh, raising vegetables and how to prepare them, etc. Smoking was a big no-no to her. Uh, there were several reports in newspapers that Obama had a fear of his wife as a result of this due to the smoking, uh, hence the privacy about it. Uh, there were several occasions where he was seen taking uh, nicotine gum out of his pocket and chewing it. Uh, so he was trying to quit <clears throat> uh, through the use of uh, nicotine gum. Uh, Malaya, his daughter, who was accepted to Harvard, had a picture taken of her walking across campus, and uh, here she is with a cigarette uh, in her mouth. Uh, Post-presidency. Uh, Obama's out of office. Uh, the Obamas uh, decide to stay in Washington, D.C., and they buy a house there. Uh, most people who work in Washington, D.C. live outside of the District of Columbia. They live in Arlington, Virginia, which is just uh, 
uh, you know, a few miles away. Uh, but why did they buy a house? Why stay in Washington, D.C.? What was the draw there? And it was their younger daughter uh, who was still in high school. They wanted her to be able to finish high school uh, with the people she had started with. <clears throat> Another, uh, the, the only other president I know of who uh, stayed in Washington, D.C. after his presidency was Woodrow Wilson. And uh, Woodrow Wilson, of course, had had a stroke when he was in office. The last year and a half, most people say his, his wife, Edith Bowling Galt, was indeed president of the United States. He was uh, put up in a, a bedroom in the White House, and she'd go in and visit him and have him sign things. And, but he was pretty infirm, uh, having had a stroke. And uh, he wanted to stay in Washington, D.C. They bought a house there. And he would get hauled out to the automobile uh, that he owned. And a chauffeur would regularly drive him around in uh, Washington, D.C. just as a leisure time activity. The one time he got out for an occasion was the funeral of uh, Warren Harding. And uh, he just simply drove past the funeral site. When he got back to his home and got out of the car and was being carried into his house, there were uh, scores of people who had lined up. And uh, he just simply said in a very weak voice, thanks for coming. And in he went. Uh, the Obamas are, uh, at any rate, uh, among that very small group of uh, two presidents who lived in Washington, D.C. after completing their terms in office. Uh, they purchased a home in the Calorama uh, neighborhood, which is near DuPont Circle. Uh, here is a map of the DuPont Circle area. Uh, interesting thing about Washington, D.C., when it was designed and built, it was built to be uh, a bunch of circles with streets radiating out from the circles. DuPont Circle is probably the most famous of these circles. Uh, I've been to DuPont Circle. I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. I don't know how many times I've been there. Uh, several times uh, uh, just so uh, we could uh, look around, go to museums, et cetera. And uh, other times I was sent out there by the university to do uh, research. Uh, I uh, spent about three years researching Hubert Humphrey's life. Uh, the university set up a museum for Humphrey and I did the research for it. And uh, I, I had an office that had a big sign on the door that said uh, Humphrey Commemorative Exhibit. And people just visiting campus would come in and talk to me occasionally. One guy stopped in and he said, uh, I lived in Washington, DC. He said, I'm from Minneapolis here. But he said, consequently, I knew who Hubert Humphrey was. He was a senator from Minnesota. So I, uh, one day, he said I was driving around DuPont Circle, and on one of the corners, there was Humphrey standing there. So I pulled over, and I said, Senator, hey, I know who you are. I'm from Minnesota. And uh, Humphrey said to him, could you give me a ride? He says, uh, I've been waiting half an hour for my sister. She's really late. She was going to pick me up. So he said, I gave uh, Humphrey a ride to, I, I've forgotten where, someplace else. And, uh, and amazingly, I met Humphrey's sister after that also. Uh, let's see, there was 
Yeah, I was feeling like I had another story there. Anyhow, here is a, an aerial view of the DuPont circle. Uh, these are huge circles. I mean, it's not like these nice circles we've seen appearing here in the Twin Cities um, and uh, you're around the thing in 10 seconds. Uh, these were big circles, multi-laned. Uh, here you can see this one's got at least half a dozen streets coming into it. And uh, they're large enough that uh, the center is parkland. It's not just planting such as we see here in the Twin Cities. Uh, interesting thing about it, Washington DC is built on these roundabouts, what we call them today. Uh, St. Paul has an interesting history from the downtown area. Streets go straight out, you know, downtown isn't a circle, but in, instead of just simply developing out from downtown in a broad pattern, Instead of that, people would buy a street uh, or an area where they'd put in a street, and it might be three miles long, and they'd build all along that. And then slowly it would fill in uh, on neighboring streets. Uh, Payne Avenue and Arcade are examples. I've got them in a large uh, black circle there that you can see. And if you drive Arcade or Payne, you can see they're very old, uh, old streets and full of businesses and then the houses developed uh, on the neighboring streets. Um, Payne Avenue had an interesting history. Some guy came here from the South and uh, named Payne Avenue after himself set it up, a real estate developer, <clears throat> the Civil War started. He went back to his Southern state and fought in the Confederacy. Minnesota said, since you're a Confederate, we're confiscating your land along Payne Avenue. Finally, about 35, 36 years after the um, Civil War had ended in 1901, his heirs sued uh, the city of St. Paul, who then uh, paid um, tens of thousands of dollars to those heirs, heirs for having um, uh, taken over the Payne Avenue site. Uh, this is Obama's house in Washington, D.C. Quite a joint. Got a nice little witch's hat tower there. You can see fireplace towers, very interesting brickwork. I wouldn't want to have to be shoveling that uh, stairway up to the front door, however. Uh, here's the interior of it. Uh, you can see a couple of the photos there have fireplaces in them. And uh, it's uh, pretty much a white place, unlike uh, Donald Trump. Uh, facilities where he lives that are all gold in, in color. <clears throat> uh, cost was $8.1 million for that house. Where in the world did the Obamas get that kind of money? He'd been a community organizer in Chicago. He did have a law degree. His wife did too, so they both worked at law firms also, but uh, $8.1 million house. Well, what happened was a book deal after he left the presidency. His, um, both he and his wife were approached by Penguin Random House, a book publisher. And six weeks after leaving the presidency, they signed a contract with Penguin Random House. Uh, both agreed to write one book, and they did so. And for writing that one book, $65 million is what they were given. So uh, $8.1 million is just a nice little 12 or 13% of uh, the money that they had uh, gained 
from a contract to write a book. Uh, the Clintons a decade earlier had made the same agreement and got $21 million. So uh, a lot of people were arguing that the Clintons should have held out for uh, more money after leaving the White House. Um, uh, this is uh, common among uh, former presidents to write a, a book, uh, a memoir about what they did. Some actually write biographies. A memoir is just, here's stuff I remember. A biography is based on uh, things you uh, actually did. Uh, and uh, it's based on documents and same with autobiographies uh, or a biography written by someone else. They are based on some sort of factual information, whereas a memoir is is different. It's just, uh, here's how I saw it kind of book. Um, presidents also have books that come out when they're campaigning. There are people that collect those campaign books <clears throat> that uh, presidents had, had written during the campaign. And actually, many of them weren't written by the president, they were written by someone else. The president would speak to that person and then they'd uh, put out a book under the candidate's name and it would be something that was seen to be very useful in getting them and their ideas known uh, during the campaign for a party nomination. The most famous and most expensive campaign biography in US history is that of Franklin Pierce? Everybody goes, why? Geez, nobody's even hardly ever heard of the guy. The reason is it was written by his college roommate, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, Post-presidency, an award. Uh, he uh, received the uh, Kennedy Presidential Library Award called the Profiles in Courage Award. Here it is being presented to him uh, by uh, Kennedy's daughter. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a lantern is what it is. Uh, and it, you know, you can fill it with oil and fire it up. Uh, uh, pres uh, appearances that uh, were made by Obama. Uh, he, you know, left office in 2017, and it's amazing uh, the amount of stuff that he did uh, over the next few months. Uh, first was in April, so this is just like, uh, uh, you know, three. Uh, months after uh, leaving the presidency in April of 2017, there was a conference at the University of Chicago. And of course, this was uh, Obama's, where he'd settled as an adult. He'd lived in Indonesia and he'd lived in Hawaii. And, but uh, as an adult and as a community organizer, he was settled uh, in Chicago. So they called him back. Uh, to the University of Chicago. And the title of the conference was A New Generation in Politics. And here's a, a photograph of the people speaking there, right in the middle, leaning forward, you can see uh, Obama. And it's about uh, people in his age group now being involved in politics and what sorts of changes will we see uh, what sorts of uh, differences will people in that age group make? Uh, in May of 2017, uh, there was an election in France and uh, this is Macron who uh, Obama supported. He announced, I support this guy. I've known him, I've dealt with him. He's great stuff. So here we have Obama getting involved in foreign elections. 
but uh, this wasn't the only one. He also endorsed uh, Angela Merkel, who he's pictured here with, uh, to be chancellor of Germany. Obama said uh, when his presidency was over that uh, this was the most helpful and interesting relationship he had during his presidency was with Angela Merkel. Uh, he also visited uh, Prince Harry here. Uh, this is when Prince Harry was still in the royal family and still in England. He uh, now got out, uh, uh, moved to Canada for a while, and then uh, Los Angeles, where he's now living. Uh, he's married to a black woman. And um, uh, basically what they together said was they had, uh, they just had difficulties with all the notice they were getting as royals, but they also had a couple of family members who were very upset about an interracial marriage. So they wanted out. And there were lots of attacks about the interracial marriage in, in the British press. Uh, November and December of 2017, he visited China, a uh, city of Shanghai. Uh, show you a map in a second. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And this is a group uh, made up of uh, different countries and people who were uh, interested in combating terrorism. So uh, India and Pakistan, uh, the year that Obama went here in 2017, were accepted into the organization that, that year. Uh, here is a map uh, on the left, shows Shanghai, it's a port city uh, in the southern coastal area of uh, China. And uh, there's a picture from the ocean of the Shanghai kind of the downtown area. And uh, he also visited India. And uh, he, he attended a conference there called the Hindustan Times Leadership Summit. And here he, uh, uh, discussed India and how India has become a major leader in world politics. Uh, they had, uh, uh, you know, there are huge population, the second largest country in the world. <clears throat> and um, they had also uh, have nuclear weapons, which seems to be something that uh, uh, gets countries lots of attention. Uh, and uh, people started to become known or started to know who the leaders of India were. Uh, uh, while he was in India, he met with the Dalai Lama. Now, the uh, Tibetan Buddhists we think of as Tibet, but when China invaded Tibet, the Dalai Lama and other religious leaders uh, escaped and uh, set up uh, homes in Northern India. So today the Dalai Lama and uh, lots of former Tibetan uh, Buddhists are living in <clears throat> Northern India. And uh, here is Obama uh, meeting with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama has come to the Twin Cities several times. Uh, uh, I think about 20 years ago, he was here. He spoke at Northrop Auditorium on the campus of the university, $50 a ticket. Post-presidency announcements. Uh, Obama made uh, comments about uh, Republican policies uh, after he left the presidency. And there were th three major ones. Uh, Trump got us out of the Paris Accords. What were the Paris Accords? They were a, a climate agreement. 
you know, everybody's going to try to reduce their carbon emissions. And Trump said, we're not interested in that. So we got out. And Obama stated, that's a rejection of the future or the possibility of a future, uh, unless we start cleaning up our environment. And uh, he said, uh, with the United States now being taken out of the Paris Accords by Trump, what, um, what we need to do is federal government is going to do nothing. So state and local governments, it's your responsibility to continue this fight. Uh, Senate Republicans wanted to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we know it as Obamacare. Obamacare was originally a term uh, that this bill started to be called by Republicans. And that the intent of that term, Obamacare, was to be derisive about the act. So the Affordable Care Act, or commonly called Obamacare. Uh, the Republicans introduced a bill that would replace the Affordable Care Act, and it was called the Better Care Act, and this was in uh, 2017. So they wanted to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, do something different with it. Uh, Obama said, here's what's in the act. It's going to transfer wealth upward. Uh, major portions of uh, payments would be the responsibility of the patient, uh, not part of the program. Uh, prices will rise dramatically as a result of this Republican bill. It's going to cost a lot more. Coverage will be reduced. There are things that won't be covered. In particular was um, uh, existing conditions, and they would not be allowed. So if within the program, uh, if you had to change carriers, they could say, well, we're not going to treat your diabetes. You had that before you came to us. You had it under your former. So that was a big issue about uh, the Affordable Care Act was that it would not allow insurance companies to say, <clears throat> Uh, we don't have to treat a certain thing that you have because you had it before you got to us. <clears throat> uh, the deferred action on childhood arrivals. We still hear about this. It's called DACA. Uh, and it's about uh, families that came into the United States from uh, Mexico, Central America, and South American countries. <clears throat> These children, they really had nothing to do or say about where they were being taken. It was their parents that had made the decision. They were brought here, they were four years old. Now they're college students. Now we're saying, <clears throat> we need all these people that came into the country to leave, we wanna deport them. What about these children who really never had a say in it? That's what DACA is, Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals. In other words, you can stay here, we'll look into your situation. Uh, this is Jeff Sessions. He was the Attorney General under Trump, <clears throat> announced in September of 2017 that this program would end. No special consideration given to children uh, who had, were brought into the country by their parents. This was part of the Trump administration. <clears throat> Obama made comments about this. He had a uh, Facebook account and uh, to this day hasn't been kicked off of it. Uh, uh, Trump preferred uh, Twitter, which he has been kicked off of. Uh, no, uh, uh, so Obama made uh, lots of negative comments about, uh, come on, you got to give these children some special consideration. Uh, many of them uh, have uh, 
don't even remember having grown up or lived someplace else. And they, you know, they've been basically adopted into this society. So leave it alone. Uh, pipe bombs. Uh, for the Obamas, all their mail is screened. This is true of people in important uh, positions uh, politically and even uh, the heads of corporations. Somebody else looks at the mail. The mail gets screened somehow. It's x-rayed, uh, that sort of thing. Well, on 24 October of 2018, a package for Obama arrived and was being looked at by his inspectors. Uh, the return address on it was from Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was a Florida Congress uh, person. And she had also been uh, head of the Democratic uh, Committee uh, for elections uh, at one time. But of course, it wasn't actually from her. And a pipe bomb was found in the package. Uh, two days later, uh, this man, uh, Cesar Sayoc, was arrested. He had sent this pipe bomb to Obama, and he was a John Donald uh, Trump uh, supporter. Uh, he also, he sent bombs to many Democrats and to many media people uh, whose opinions in their newspapers he didn't like. Another person that received uh, one of these pipe bombs was Hillary Clinton. Uh, here is a list of people who received pipe bombs. Joe Biden, who had uh, been vice president under Obama, today he's president. Uh, Cory Booker, who had been uh, governor of New Jersey and now uh, is a U.S. senator from New Jersey uh, and a black man. John Brennan, a CIA director. James Clapper, a national intelligence director. Hillary Clinton, who we've mentioned, uh, been Secretary of State and had received the nomination for the presidency in 2016 and was uh, lost to uh, Donald Trump. CNN News, a media organization, received a pipe bomb from uh, Mr. Sayoc. Kamala Harris, who was a US Senator uh, and current Vice President received uh, a pipe bomb. Eric Holder was attorney general under uh, Obama, a black man. Robert De Niro, the actor. Uh, De Niro has been outspoken on uh, liberal causes. He uh, was especially uh, uh, concerned about Donald Trump's presidency. He had spoken out against Trump. Uh, he was giving an award at the Academy Awards. Uh, he walked out uh, to start naming the nominees for that award. And the first two words out of his mouth were the F word followed by the name Trump. And uh, uh, that was on national TV Academy Awards. Tom Steyer and George Soros, both businessmen, who have been very supportive of the Democratic Party. Uh, and of course, Obama and uh, Maxine Waters, a, uh, I think she's a California Congress person uh, and, and a black woman. Uh, Sayrock was sentenced to 20 years in prison, pled guilty. Uh, there were lots of protests about this, uh, lots of letters to the judicial system saying the guy should have gotten a life sentence. Uh, now his legacy. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, issue was raised last week. Uh, and uh, somebody said what was, uh, or asked what was Obama's uh, greatest accomplishment. We're gonna take a look at seven things that uh, 
a variety of different people have said are Obama's legacy or Obama's great accomplishments. And we mentioned uh, two weeks ago, health care. This is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And uh, it, uh, you know, it didn't give health coverage to all Americans. It gave health coverage to people below a certain income level who were most likely uh, not to have health coverage through an employer. House of Representatives uh, voted a total of 60 times to abolish the Affordable Care Act. And it passed, passed every time, uh, but the Senate never considered it. Uh, the House at the time was controlled by Republicans. So it's amazing, I mean, that's just an amazing number that uh, 60 times people in the House of Representatives voted to be rid of Obamacare. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the number one thing uh, that uh, people evaluating presidents and uh, news media that says, here's the greatest thing. This is the thing that most people consider Obama's greatest accomplishment was the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare. Uh, second was the economy. When Obama took office, <clears throat> there had been a gigantic downturn in the economy. It had begun a year before he took office. Most people call it the Great Recession of 2008. Many people call it the Lesser Depression of 2008. Um, and Obama, during the first year he was in office, this was one of the major things that he had to manage was uh, recovery from this uh, recession, depression uh, of the last year of the Bush administration. Uh, as you're aware, anytime you see a graph or a picture, you can't read with an arrow through it. I've enlarged it on the next page. Uh, this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In 2007, it's at, it's October 2007. It's at 14,000. And uh, a year later, it's at about 7,000 cut in half. So this, uh, just looking at uh, Wall Street, this was a tremendous uh, drop. Uh, the Dodd-Frank bill was passed, named after the two sponsors of it uh, in order to uh, help deal with this uh, uh, recession, depression. It placed greater controls on Wall Street and um, had a lot of consumer protection stuff in it. But uh, neither of those things really did anything uh, to stop the economic downturn. Uh, and the reason was it just simply wasn't enforced. There are endless federal laws that um, just simply do not get enforced. Uh, unless you've got some department with a bank of attorneys and they're watching for violations of federal laws, we really end up with nothing happening. Third item that's considered of great import during the Obama administration is uh, LGBTQ legislation, uh, military, uh, reforms were instituted, uh, hate crimes were defined, uh, you know, we had defined them uh, based on race, now they were defined based on sexual preference. Gallup poll took a, took a poll and 68% uh, of Americans approved of these uh, reforms, 
um, military and and uh, making LGBTQ crimes hate crimes. Uh, four, uh, there was a uh, <clears throat> uh, gender equality issues, uh, male and female. Uh, Glamour magazine ran an article that was published after Obama's presidency. And uh, they talked about his attitude and how it had changed. And when they interviewed Obama, he said uh, two things that really changed me or got me concerned about uh, gender equality was working with women in the White House and uh, seeing how capable they were and having two daughters and watching them grow up and what sorts of interests they had. And fifth, uh, deals with the military. A uh, huge increase in drone strikes. A drone is an airplane that has no one on board and it's controlled by some guy sitting in Arizona and he can bring it over a site someplace, drop a bomb and return the drone to a landing area uh, that might be 8,000 miles away. There were a total of 26,000 uh, drone strikes during the Obama presidency. Uh, the reason it gets mentioned is because the loss of US lives was minimized uh, as a result. Um, even though there are lots of US troops around the world. Uh, federal prisons, uh, population decreased under uh, Jimmy Carter uh, in federal prisons, but uh, under Reagan, H.W. Bush, Clinton, and W. Bush, uh, federal uh, prison populations rose. Under Obama, they declined. Uh, his ranking, uh, there are polls are taken uh, by historians and there are polls that are taken uh, by the general public. Uh, Obama's approval rating among the general public has uh, ranked right around the 60th percentile uh, since he has left office. Uh, Siena College, um, every seven years, they ask about 800 historians to rank the presidents. And they have about 20 categories that they're ranked in, you know, stuff like domestic affairs, foreign affairs, uh, individual rights, uh, et cetera. Uh, in the last uh, poll taken by Siena College of these historians, uh, they had Obama ranked as the eighth greatest president. That places him in the top 20%. And that's uh, the end of the Obama lectures. And will uh, Judy will come in and. I am here, JB. Would you stop sharing your screen, if you would, uh, so that uh, I can appear on screen? Um, yeah. Before we begin with the questions, I have to say uh, one thing. Um, because I was a Russian history major in college, uh, my college professors would not forgive me if I didn't uh, speak up here and say, I think you meant that the um, that it was not Nikita Khrushchev who was raised in Georgia, but Joseph Stalin. Nikita Khrushchev is just a regular old Russian. So, and I'm sure that was just a, a momentary oversight. But as I say, my uh, professors from college would rise out of the grave if I didn't say something. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I had wanted to tell that story about meeting that guy. Who right, was right, school, yeah. So, yeah, sure. thanks. Um, but let's go forward to the questions. Uh, and we do have a few. Uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes, so if anyone else has a question, I think we have time for more than the ones that we have in the Q&A line, uh, but I will start right up so that we can get to as many as possible. Uh, this person says, there was a huge slave market in 
uh, Zanzibar, Tanzania, that's in East Africa. It was presided over by Arab traders until it was shut down by the British in 1873. Obama's heritage may not be connected to American slavery, but given the size and duration of the slave market in Zanzibar, it is possible that some of his ancestors were slaves elsewhere. This might be an interesting area to explore. Would you have you heard of that? Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, and, and uh, you know the people saw money to be made in those West African colonies. American slave traders didn't want to go that far. Cost more money, take longer, etc. So mm -hmm. a lot of the U.S. slave trade uh, came out of that West Africa area. Uh, because America, because uh, you know, U.S. people weren't interested in that longer trip, but uh, um, African native peoples capturing uh, other Africans uh, were willing to make a trip that long, meaning from the uh, east side of Africa. Sounds like Thanks. this is a yeah, good, good point. Sounds like this is a great opportunity for that, you know, those genetic testing 23andMe, find out if you're related to uh, Barack Obama, if you happen to be in the African diaspora. Um, question, might the Nobel Peace, excuse me, might the Nobel Peace Prize have been awarded in the hope of preventing further wars. It was awarded, of course, close to the beginning of Obama's uh, administration. And then the person says, alas, I hope that was not fulfilled. Yes, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, we hope you'll do a great job was one of the <laughs> comments that was made. And, and as I had also mentioned, it was uh, glad to be rid of of W. Bush on the international scene mm. by people who didn't like his policies. And we've got a couple of questions about uh, Obama's and Michelle Obama's book deal. Um, this questioner says, did Trump or Melania have, uh, has, do either of them have book deals? I, do, I, I don't know. Uh, but there's no next week for me to look it up. And <laughs> well, I'll have to wait till you come back. <laughs> All I, right. I, I have not heard about that. And I, my suspicions would be that is something Trump would want to do himself because he would then get uh, all the profit off of it. Um, and he's got the resources to do it. Uh, and he doesn't need you know, he doesn't need a multi-million dollar book deal. Uh, he's, he's well set financially. And so I, I would, and I would think he's probably not interested in doing anything until he knows what's going to happen in 2024. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, another question uh, about uh, the book, the book deal. What sort of return did the publishing house get on their investment? It, was it $65 million, I think you said? Uh, what yeah. sort of return did they get? Did, did uh, Obama and Michelle Obama's books make money? Well, and again, that's something I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the book publishers think that they will get that money back. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have these books in perpetuity. So yeah. uh, decades from now, these books will still be selling. Mm -hmm. uh, even though you might say, well, it's just a small portion of society in 100 years, it's going to be buying and reading Obama's books. But how many books are still on the market a hundred years later? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, um, uh, you know, they, they're looking ahead. At, they, they got a real long run with, a, with owning a presidential memoir. Mm -hmm. But okay. I, I, don't know, I don't know where Penguin is at today with mm -hmm. 
profit off of that $65 million contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then moving on to the recipients of all those pipe bombs, have any Republican politicians received pipe bombs? Well, again, I don't know. I'd be very surprised if they hadn't. Um, mm -hmm. um, a questioner wants to know, uh, do you plan to do a session on Trump in the no. future? That is? Uh, no, I don't. And, uh, I, you know, back uh, when I finished John F. Kennedy, I went, we're at a point now with senior citizens and class. You can remember these people. It isn't mm -hmm. history. It's political science. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to quit now. I'll go back and start over. Well, people said, no, don't quit. One of the comments that I would receive commonly was, um, uh, we remember these recent presidents, but um, don't remember the details. Mm -hmm. So it's real interesting hearing about the legislation and their backgrounds and stuff like that. So I've continued to do it. Mm -hmm. In part, going in part, um, not doing Trump is uh, it's so current, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm kind of nervous about it. Mm -hmm. Get a bunch of guys wearing red hats and carrying guns. <laughs> and clubs, <you> know. <laughs> well, if we're all around in 20 years, maybe we'll consider it then. How's that? And, and, yeah, and um. Uh, the first line of my course description would be uh, on Donald Trump would be, never a kind word will be spoken. Oh, dear. All right. Well, at least you give fair warning. All right. Um, the, uh, this commenter says, uh, perhaps the first uh, Obama campaign themes of positivity, inclusiveness, and yes, we can, uh, may have affected the decision of the Nobel Committee. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think the, the race issue and the rise of uh, a person of color in American politics had a lot to do with it. And, uh, and he was, he's a joyful character, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he just uh, a, a young family guy, you mm -hmm. know, it's a, there were just lots of things that led to that. I, I guess I really buy into the, um, there was a lot of nervousness about George W. Bush international policies. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that whole notion of uh, Bush is no longer in charge of U.S. world affairs played a big role. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of comments here or suggestions for future projects that you might consider. Uh, one comment, oh, JB, you on Trump would be hilarious, especially once we meet again in person with all those donut holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then a more um, substantial suggestion. Um, this person says, what about us doing a series on Hubert Humphrey? Uh, there have been lots of suggestions about uh, other things that I could be doing. Hubert Humphrey's one of them because I spent since a long period of time uh, on his uh, life. But um, the broader issue there is he's a guy that ran for president and lost. Mm -hmm. How about doing a series on all the losers? <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly enough, there's a book on that, uh -huh. and it's called, it's called they, they Also Ran. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, it's available, it's in print, you can get it on Amazon, even though it was written back, I think, in the 1940s, mm -hmm. and then was added on to later. So there's a book on that, and the author says... Um, Probably the greatest loser of all time was James Cox, who lost to Warren mm. G. Harding. 
and mm-hmm. his running mate for vice president, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh-huh, interesting. Okay, uh, we've got so, a, a uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, if they maintain an interest on that, I recommend the book. Okay, uh, we've got a, a comment here, or no, a, 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 an announcement, basically, going back to the question about uh, East African heritage and slave trade. This person says, I think the Institute of Advanced Studies is doing a lecture about the Mideastern slave trade tomorrow. Then uh, the person has put a a URL, a, a web location uh, in the question. And I have put that uh, uh, URL in the chat line. So if someone is interested uh, in the Institute of Advanced Studies at the U uh, and this talk, uh, just quickly copy my link that I've put in the chat line. Actually, I'll put it in the chat line to everybody here in a minute. Um, Let's see, one, uh, I think we have time for just maybe one last question. And that is, uh, when you think back on um, uh, the the role of post-president, the post-presidential role, um, some presidents have been better in that role than others. I think everybody agrees that um, uh, Jimmy Carter did an exemplary job in that role. Um, how has uh, Obama been doing with that regard? Has Obama been a, a good post-president? Well, not, not compared to Jimmy Carter, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, uh, you know, sitting here, uh, I can't name anything really much beyond, I mean, he was so busy that first year Mm -hmm. uh, making political announcements and uh, supporting people he'd work with in in Europe, et cetera. But um, I I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't name a thing in the last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no. History is long, Obama is still young, so there may be other things. I think we have come to the end of our time here. I wanna thank everyone uh, who uh, attended this series. This is the end of this series on Barack Obama, but as JB announced uh, at the beginning of his talk, he will be back with a new online series uh, starting March 23rd, This time it will be on the history of psychology by J.B. Anderson. So uh, we are already taking registrations for the new series on our website, perhaps through Ali. Um, So if you're interested, we hope that many of you will sign up. But for right now, I'm going to say thank you to everyone involved, especially J.B. Anderson, the audience, and our behind the scene, our excellent behind the scene uh, tech support. Thank you, everyone. See you again.